Today, we will talk about the rise and fall of crypto, the history of Nike, and America's most favorite novel of all time. So stay tuned. Hello, friends. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. If it's your first time here, my name is Nicholas, and my goal for this year was to read 100 books. In this series of videos, I wanted to give a brief summary and overview of each and every one of them, as well as give my own personal opinion and rating in the end. So without further ado, let's continue the series with book number 26. Perfume by Patrick Süskind. This book is a classic of German literature, and interestingly enough, it's pretty much a one-hit wonder by author Patrick Süskind. He published a few other shorter novellas and essays before and after, but pretty much peaked with the perfume. The public also knows very little about him. He has pretty much withdrawn himself from literary society and does not grant interviews or allow himself to be photographed. 37 years after its original debut, the perfume sold over 20 million copies in its lifetime, got translated into 49 languages and was in the German bestseller list for over 9 years. After having read it in school, school myself more than a decade ago, I deemed it a classic worth revisiting and dive back in. What makes the perfume so special is that it revolves around our sense of smell. I really can't think of any other work of fiction, whether that's books or movies with the same approach or idea. Our protagonist is a boy named Grenouille. Born in 1738 on a fish market in Paris, between rotten flesh and heaps of garbage, he's quickly shunned by his mother and gets raised in an orphanage early on. Unknown to other people, Grenouille has a remarkable sense of smell, giving him the extraordinary ability to pick up the most subtle odors, even across great distances. We follow him over the span of several years, roaming France in search for the one thing his soul is craving like nothing else. To find the ultimate smell and encapsulate it in the one and only perfume, one like no other mankind has ever created. This book was very close to getting the full 5 stars, but I will give it 4.5 instead. Mainly because a few scenes feel somewhat over the top. I can't go into detail without going to spoilers, but really it you will know which ones I mean. That being said, the perfume is beautifully written. Patrick Süskind is an absolute master of the German language, crafting every sentence to perfection, making smells and the process of creating perfumes really come alive. Despite some lengthy parts, the book has a wonderful flow, lively, quirky characters and is an olfactory journey back in time like very few others out there. Rework by Jason Fried and David Heinemeyer Hansen. Chances are you've never heard the names of these two authors before, but you might be familiar with the most well-known product. Basecamp, a relatively popular project management and team communication software. They are the founder and lead programmer of 37signals, the web software company which developed Basecamp amongst other similar products. Rework is just one of a few books these guys have published alongside their web development job. And this one reminded me a lot of Derek Sivers' Anything You Want, which I've discussed in detail in this video right here. Rework is a collection of small business advice, given from these startup founders to the next generation. It's a pretty interesting and refreshing take on the formula, as their approach to business is fairly wholesome and humane compared to what most other business books or self-made billionaires tell you to do. Rework has an anti-stance to most common business practices, as the authors advise against making a business plan, despise meetings, and advocate for normal working day hours instead of burning the midnight oil. I can think of at least one very popular businessman who would probably despise most of the advice given in this book. And in my very own personal opinion, this shows that most business advice given is more often not just a product of survivorship bias. There is no cookie cutter way to form a successful business. It's always only a matter of increasing or decreasing your chances, but there will never be any 100% guarantees. I think most importantly, and that goes for many ventures in life, you have to know yourself first. Know about your anxieties, realistically estimate your risk tolerance, and design your business and approach to it around that, meaning yourself. This being said, Rework will get 4 stars from me, as it takes a very interesting and refreshing approach to the business advice formula. I can wholeheartedly recommend it to freelancers or small business owners, as it might give you some good inspiration on how to run things differently. Make your own choices in the end. Think about what works best for the person that you are. But this is a good collection of takeaways that at least work for the authors on several occasions. I too am an advocate for a work smart, not hard approach to business. So maybe that's why I resonated so well with this book. And given that it's a short read as well, your time will definitely not feel wasted. To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee the Great American Read was an 8 episode long mini TV series by US American TV network PBS. It asked its viewers the question, which book is the country's most influential and favorite novel? And the winner was, as you might have guessed it, Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. Published in 1960, this book sold 18 million copies, won several awards like the Pulitzer Prize, got turned into an award winning movie adaptation and theater plays, and is read in schools around the world to this day. It is quite a monumental book as you can see, one that apparently everyone should read in their lifetime, so I felt it was a about time to give it a read myself. 
The story is set in the fictional town of Maycomb, Alabama, during the years of the Great Depression between 1933 and 1935. We follow eight-year-old girl Scout, who lives with her brother Jam and her widowed father Atticus in this quaint town. Atticus is a prominent lawyer, a wise and righteous man, very tolerant and always fighting to find balanced and just solutions. One day, he agrees to defend a black man falsely accused of raping a white woman, and thereby turns the community of Maycomb against him. We follow the plot from his daughter Scout's point of view, as she questions the racist tendencies of the time, learning about the rights and wrongs of 1930s society from her father in the process of this trial. I came away from this book with conflicted feelings. The message it tries to convey is by all means well intended. It clearly condemns social injustice and racial profiling, which sadly are issues we're still dealing with to this day. The way it tries to frame this message feels very one-dimensional though, as our understanding of racism expanded drastically since the book's first publication. Today it could even be seen as a white savior narrative, in which a rich white man has to defend the poor black guy, written by a white middle class author who most likely never experienced the form of racism she tries to lay bare. You have to see this book as a product of its time, and again, I am sure that the author's intentions were righteous and well intended, but I just feel like it overall didn't age that well. We moved on from this one dimensional approach of dismantling racism. As for the story itself then, it almost feels like two books merged into one, as the first half could almost be described as a mystery novel, a ghost story. And it is only the second half which picks up on the main plot I described earlier and gains momentum. I am not going to lie, I was a bit bored for a majority of this book, up until the trial begins, as up until then, really not that much happens, and so overall this book feels worthy of 3 stars to me. I can absolutely see why To Kill a Mockingbird became such an instant classic in the 1960s society when our public discussion of how to condemn racism was in earlier stages. Measured by today's standards, I feel like there would be way more appropriate books to convey the same message, and the story it's trying to tell could have done with some thorough editing, as it takes a good while to pick up. If you have read To Kill a Mockingbird, I would love to hear your thoughts, as I'm sure that I'm a bit of an outlier with my opinion given the overall massively positive reception of this classic, so I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. The Cryptopians by Laura Shin This is a book from a crypto nerd for crypto nerds. Laura Shin used to be a writer for Forbes magazine, covering the financial and cryptocurrency markets before leaving the outlet in 2018 to focus on her podcast Unchained, which also has a heavy focus on the crypto space. The Cryptopians then is the product of several years of research and investigative journalism, broadly covering the development history of the cryptocurrency Ethereum. It's a chronologically written report from the beginning of the project up until the early months of 2018, from how Vitalik Buterin wrote the white paper of the project and assembled the founding crew until this founding crew fell apart part years later. From when one Ethereum was worth just a few pennies, up to the craze of the early 2018 bull run, at which one Ethereum peaked at a price of about 1400 US dollars. The book also covers in much detail the history of the DAO hack, several side projects of the Ethereum crew and tries to unwind the social conflicts within the Ether development team. After having now finished this book, I wanted to love it but it gave me a hard time along the way. Since 2019, I'm an active participant in the crypto space myself, constantly learning about this new exciting technology and trying to educate friends and family about it. I would describe myself as fairly knowledgeable about the topic and yet this book was overwhelming. The amount of research the author did is absolutely astonishing. Every happening is described in excruciating detail. No story beat, as minor as it might be, is left out, which ultimately lets the book choke on its overflow of information and lack of consistent editing. It's a fascinating read nevertheless, but you need to know what you're up for. So in conclusion, I will give it four stars, but only for people with a deep interest in the crypto space. The Cryptopians is probably the most detailed report on the history of Ethereum out there. It can lose itself a bit in all of its minutia, but if you weed out all the fluff, there's some great investigative journalism to be found here. Some parts of this this book are pretty eye-opening, especially when she touches on the weird stories surrounding Cardano founder Charles Hoskinson or goes into detail about the absolute mind-boggling valuations of some early crypto projects, which more often than not are just an empty GitHub page and a white paper. So as I've said, this is a book written by a crypto nerd for crypto nerds. Shoe Dog by Phil Knight there are some brands which manage to become such cultural phenomena that every human being, even in the most remote parts of the world, recognizes them. Whether that's McDonald's, Mickey Mouse or Nike. Founded in the 1960s under the old name Blue Ribbon, the company grew to become a $170 billion brand and its legendary logo, the swoosh, is one of the most recognizable corporate identities ever. I myself only own Nike shoes, so it was a given that at some point or another I had to dive into this much recommended and beloved book. Shoe Dog is the retelling of Nike's story, told by founder Phil Knight himself, spending over the course of 18 years. By the young age of 24, in 1962, Phil is an avid runner. Growing up in Portland, Oregon, he gets regular training from legendary track coach and mentor Bill Bowerman. 
One day, Phil gets wind of a Japanese manufacturer of running shoes and plans to import their so-called tigers into America. Soon after, Blue Ribbon is born. Business grows quite quickly and so a few years later and after some disputes with the manufacturer of the tiger, the team is forced to walk on their own line of running shoes. The word Nike comes to a co-worker Phil in a dream and in a whim they decide to go with that name as Nike is the goddess of victory in Greek mythology. Little did they know at the time that victorious they will be, but not without shedding sweat, tears and a lot of money along the way, always one defaulting credit away from bankruptcy. The book also goes into detail about the origin of the Swoosh logo, the famed concept of pumping air into shoes and all the legal trouble Nike had to go through over the years to become the mega brand that it is today. Shoe Dog is entertaining and fascinating from start to finish, worthy of the full five stars. Given that Phil Knight does not have a literary background and that he's not an author by craft, this book is amazingly well written. It's a personal, gripping and oftentimes humble story that he describes here. It took him eight years to finish this book and it shows that pacing is brilliant and every character gets enough room to breathe. Shoe Dog is a must read for fans of the brand, for people who love podcasts like How I Built This, or if you just want to hear a business story with a whole bunch of plot twists. The company had to master a whole lot of challenges over the years. More often than not, it took a good amount of luck to come out victorious on the other side. Maybe it was the goddess of victory who gave her blessing. So these were another 5 out of 100 books for this year. If you enjoyed this content, please leave me a like. And if you fancy buying any of these books now, check out the links in my description below. For more book reviews like this, have a look at this playlist. Thank you and see you next time. Ciao.